Chapter 2 Counter Earth I remembered nothing from the time I'd boarded the silver disc in the mountains of New Hampshire until now. I awoke, feeling rested, and opened my eyes, half expecting to see my room and the alumni house upon the college. I turned my head without pain or discomfort. I seemed to be lying on some hard, flat object, perhaps a table, in a circular room with a low ceiling some seven feet high. There were five narrow windows, not large enough to let a man through, but they rather reminded me of ports for bowmen in a castle tower, yet they admitted sufficient light to allow me to recognize my surroundings. There was a tapestry to the right, a well-woven depiction of some hunting scene. I took it, but fancifully done. The spear-carrying hunters mounted upon birds of a sort, and attacked an ugly animal that reminded me of a boar, except that it appeared to be too large, out of proportion to the hunters. Its jaws carried four tusks, curved like scimitars. It reminded me, with the vegetation and background and the classic serenity of the faces, of a Renaissance tapestry I had once seen upon a vacation tour I had taken to Florence my second year from the university. Opposite the tapestry, for decoration I assumed, hung a round shield with cross spears behind it. The shield was rather like the old Greek shields on some of the red-figured vases in the London Museum. The design on the shield was unintelligible to me. I could not be sure that it was supposed to mean anything. It might have been an alphabetic monogram, or perhaps a mere delight to the artist. Above the shield was suspended a helmet, again reminiscent of Greek, perhaps of the Homeric period. It had a somewhat Y-shaped slot for the eyes, nose, and mouth, upon the nearly solid metal. There was all the savage dignity about it, with the shield and spears, all of them stable upon the wall as if ready, like the famous colonial rifle over the fireplace, for instant use. They were all polished and gleamed dully in the half-light. Aside from these things and two stone blocks, perhaps chairs, and a mat upon one side, the room was bare. The walls and ceilings and floor were smooth as marble, and a classical white. I could see no door upon the room. I rose from the stone table, which was indeed what it was, and went to the window. I looked out and saw the sun. Our sun. It had to be. It seemed perhaps a fraction larger, but it was difficult to be sure. I was confident that it was our own brilliant yellow star. The sky, like that of the earth, was blue. My first thought was that this must be the earth and the sun's apparent size a simple illusion. Obviously I was breathing, and that meant necessarily an atmosphere condition, a large percentage of oxygen. This must be the earth. But as I stood upon the window, I knew this could not be my mother planet. The building in which I found myself was apparently one of a different number of towers, like endless flat cylinders of varying sizes and colors, joined by narrow, colorful bridges that arched lightly between them. I could not lean far enough outside the window to see the ground. In the distance I could see hills covered with some type of green vegetation, but I could not determine whether or not it was grass. Wondering upon my predicament, I turned back to the table. I strode over to it and nearly bruised my thigh upon that stone structure. I felt for a moment as though I must have stumbled, or have been dizzy. I walked around the room. I leapt to the top of the table almost as I would have climbed a stair in the alumni house. It was different, a different movement. Less gravity, it had to be. The planet, then, was much smaller than our own Earth, and given the apparent size of the sun, perhaps somewhat closer to it. My clothes had been changed, my hunting boots were gone, my fur cape and the heavy coat, the rest of it too. I was clad in some sort of tunic of a reddish color, which was tied about the waist with a yellow cord. It occurred to me that I was clean, in spite of my adventures, my panic-stricken rout upon the mountains. I had been washed. 
I saw that the red ring of metal with the crest of a sea had been placed upon the second finger of my right hand. I was hungry. I tried to put my thoughts together, and I sat upon the table, but this was all too much. I felt much like a child, who knew nothing, but taken to some complex factory or store, unable to sort out all of his impressions, and unable to comprehend this new and strange thing that continually flashed incessantly upon him. A panel in the wall slid sideways. A tall, red-haired man, somewhere in his late forties, dressed much as I was, stepped through. I hadn't known what to expect, what these people would be like. This man was an earthman, apparently. He smiled at me and came forward, placing his hands upon my shoulders and looking deep into my eyes. He said, and I thought rather proudly, You are my son, Tarl Cabot. I am Tarl Cabot, I said. I am your father, he said, and he shook me powerfully by the shoulders. We shook hands, on my part rather stiffly. Yet this gesture of our common homeland somehow reassured me. I was surprised to find myself accepting this stranger, not only as a being of my world, but as the father that I could not remember. Your mother, he asked, his eyes concerned. Dead some years ago, I spoke. He looked at me. She, of all of them, I loved most. He then turned away, crossing the room. He appeared to be affected keenly and shaken. I desired to feel no sympathy with him, yet I found that I could not help it, and I was angry with myself. He had deserted my mother and me, had he not? And what was it now, that he felt some regret? And how was it that he had spoken so innocently of all of them, whoever they might be? I did not want to find out. Yet somehow, in spite of these things, I found that I wanted to cross the room, to put my hand upon his arm, to touch him. I felt somehow a kinship with him, with this stranger and his sorrow. My eyes were moist, something stirred within me, obscure, painful memories that had been silent, quiet for many years. The memory of a woman I had barely known, of a gentle face, and of arms that had protected a child who had awakened frightened in the night. Softly, I remembered another face, a face behind hers. Father, I said. He straightened and turned to face me across that simple, strange room. It was impossible to tell if he had wept, but he did look at me with sadness in his eyes, and his rather stern features seemed for a moment to be tender. Looking into his eyes, I realized, with an incomprehensible suddenness, and a joy that still bewilders me, that here was someone, someone who existed, who loved me. My son, he said. We met in the center of the room and embraced. I wept. He did too. This was wept without shame. I learned later that on this alien world, a strong man may feel and express his emotions, and that the hypocrisy of constraint is not honored upon this planet as it was upon mine. At last we moved apart. My father regarded me evenly. She will be the last, he said. I had no right to let her love me. I was silent. He sensed my feeling and spoke most brusquely. Thank you for your gift, Tarl Cavett, he said. I looked at him puzzled. The handful of earth, he said, a handful of my native ground. I nodded, not wanting to speak, wanting him to tell me the thousand things that I had to know, to dispel the mysteries that had torn me from my native world and had brought me to this strange room, this planet, to him, my father. You must be hungry, 
he said. I want to know where I am and what I am doing here, I said. Of course, he said, but you must eat. At this he smiled. While you satisfy your hunger, I shall speak to you. He clapped his hands twice, and a panel slid back again. I was startled. Through the opening came a young girl. She was somewhat younger than myself. Blonde hair, bowel-bound back. She wore a sleeveless garment of diagonal stripes, the brief skirt of which terminated some inches above her knee. She was barefoot, and as her eyes shyly met mine, I saw that they were blue and differential. My eyes suddenly noted her one piece of jewelry, a light steel-like band she wore as a collar. As quickly as she had come, she also departed. You may have her this evening if you wish, said my father, who had scarcely seemed to even notice the girl. I was not at the time sure what he meant, but I said no. At my father's instance I began to eat, reluctantly at first, never taking my eyes from him and hardly tasting the food. It was simple but excellent cuisine. The meat reminded me of venison, for it was not the meat of an animal raised upon domestic grains. It had been roasted over some open flame. The bread was still hot from the oven, and the fruit grapes, peaches of some fort, was fresh and as cold as the mountain snow. After this meal, I tasted the drink, which might not inappropriately be described as an almost incandescent wine. It was bright, it was dry, and it was most powerful. I learned later that it was called Colonna, and while I ate and afterward, my father spoke. Gore, he said, is the name of this world. It is the name in all the languages of this planet, and this word means homestone. He paused, noting my lack of comprehension. Homestone, he repeated, simply that. In a peasant villages upon this world, he continued, each hut was originally built around a flat stone, which was placed upon the center of the circular dwelling. It was carved with a family sign, and is called the home stone. It was, so to speak, a symbol of sovereignty, territory, and each peasant, in his own hut, was a sovereign. Later, spoke my father, home stones were then used for villages, and later still for cities. The home stone of a village was always placed upon the market, in a city on the top of the highest tower. The homestone came naturally in time to acquire a mystique, and something of that same hot, sweet emotion as our native peoples of earth feel toward their own flags, and that become invested within it. My father had risen to his feet, and begun to pace about the room. His eyes seemed strangely alive. In time I would come to understand more of what he felt. Indeed, there is a saying upon Gore a saying whose origin is lost much in the past of this strange planet, that one who speaks of a homestone should stand, for matters of honor are here involved, and honor is still respected in the barbaric codes of gore. These stones, spoke my father, are various of different colors, shapes, sizes. Many of them are very intricately carved, some of the largest cities of small, rather insignificant homestones but of incredible antiquity, and dating back to the beginnings of time, when the city was a village for all the amounted pride of warriors with no settled abode. My father paused upon the narrow window in the circular room and looked out into the hills beyond. He fell silent. After a long pause, he spoke again. When a man sets his home stone, he claims by law all that land for himself. And good land is protected only by the swords of the strongest owners within the vicinity. 
Swords, I spoke. Yes, said my father, as if there was nothing incredible upon this admission. He smiled. You have much to learn of gore. Yet there is a hierarchy of homestones, one might say, and two soldiers who were cut one another down with their steel blades for a simple acre of fertile ground will fight side by side to the death for the homestone of their village, over the city within whose ambient their village lies. I will show you some day, he said, my own small homestone, which I keep within my chambers, and encloses a handful of soil from the earth, a handful of soil that I first brought with me when I came to this world such a long time ago. He looked at me evenly, I shall keep this handful of earth that you brought, he said. His voice became very quiet. Some day it may be yours. His eyes seemed moist. Then he added, if you should live to earn yourself a homestone. I rose to my feet and I looked upon him. He had turned away as if lost in thought. It is the occasional dream of a conqueror or statesman, he said, to have but a single supreme homestone for his planet. Then, after a long moment, not looking upon me, he said, It is rumored that there already exists such a stone, but it lies upon the sacred place and is the source of the priest king's powers. Who are the priest kings, I asked. My father faced me and for a time he seemed troubled, as he, he might have said more than he had intended. Neither of us spoke, and a minute passed. Yes, spoke my father at last, I must speak to you of priest-kings. He once more smiled at me, but let me begin in my own way, that you may better understand the nature of that whereof I speak. We both sat down again, the stone table between us, and my father calmly and methodically explained many a thing to me. As he spoke, my father often returned to the planet Gore as the counter-earth, taking the name of the writings of the Pythagoreans, who had first speculated upon the existence of such a body. Oddly enough, one of the expressions within the tongue of Gore, for our son was La Torvis, which means central fire, another Pythagorean expression, except that it had not been, as I understand it, originally used by the Pythagoreans to refer to the sun, but to another body. The more common expression for the sun was taught to go, which means light upon the homestone. There was a sect among the people that worshipped the sun. I later learned, but it was insignificant, both in numbers and power, when compared with the widespread worship of the priest-kings who, whatever they were, were accorded the honours of divinity. Theirs, it seemed, was the honour of being enshrined as the most ancient gods of gore, and in time of danger a prayer to the peace-kings might escape the lips of even the most bravest of men. The priest-kings, spoke my father, are immortal, or so most here do believe. Do you believe it? I asked. I do not know, said my father. I think perhaps I do. What sort of men are they? I asked. Oh, it is not known that they are men, said my father. Then what are they? Hmm. Perhaps gods. You're not serious. I am, he said. Is not a creature who is beyond death, of immense power and wisdom, worthy to be so spoken of? I was quiet. My speculation, however, spoke my father, is that the priest-kings are indeed men, men much as we, or some humanoid organism of some type, who possess the science and technology so far beyond our own normal ken, as that of our own twentieth century would be to the alchemists and astrologers of the medieval His supposition did seem plausible to me, for from the very beginning I had understood that in something, or someone, existed a force and clarity of understanding, beside which the customary habits of rationality, 
as I knew them, were little more than the tropisms of the unicellular animal. Even the technology of the envelope, with its pattern thumb lock, the disorientation of my compass, and the ship that had brought me, unconscious to the strange world, argued for an incredible grasp of unusual, precise, and manipulative forces. The priest-king, said my father, maintain their sacred place in the Sadar Mountains, a wild vastness into which no man penetrates. The sacred place to the minds of most men here is taboo, it is perilous. None have returned from those mountains. My father's eyes seemed far away, as if focused upon sights he might have preferred to forget. Idealists, rebels, they've all been dashed to pieces upon the frozen encampments of those mountains. If one approaches the mountains, one must go on foot. Our beasts will not approach them. Many a part of outlawed fugitive who have sought refuge in them have been found upon the plains below, like scraps of meat simply cast from an incredible distance to the beaks and teeth of those wandering scavengers. My hand clenched upon the metal goblet. The wine moved in the vessel. I saw my image in the wine. It had become shattered by the many tiny forces within the vessel. Then once more the wine sat still. Sometimes, said my father, his eyes still far away, when men are old or have had enough of life, they assault these mountains, looking for the secrets of immortality in those barren crags. If they have found their immortality, none have confirmed it, for none have returned to the tower cities. He looked at me. Some think that such men in time become the priest-kings themselves. My own speculation, which I judge as likely or unlikely to be true, as the more popular superstitious stories, is that it is death to learn the secrets of the priest-kings. But you do not know that, I said. No, admitted my father, I do not know it. My father then explained to me something of the legends of the priest-kings, and I gathered that there seemed to be true to this degree at least, that the priest-kings could destroy or control what they wished, that they were in effect the divinities of this world. It was supposed that they were aware of all that transpired upon the planet, but if so, I was informed that they seemed, on the whole, to take much little note of it. It was rumored, according to my father, that they cultivated holiness within their mountains, and in their contemplations could not always be concerned with the realities and evils of this outside and unimportant world. They were, so to speak, absentee divinities. They were existent, but remote not to be bothered with the fears and turmoils of those mortals beyond their mountains. This conjecture, this seeking of holiness, however, seemed to me to fit not well with the sickening fate apparently awaiting those who attempted the mountains. I found it difficult to conceive of one of those theoretical saints rousing himself from contemplation to hurl the shattered scraps of interlopers down to the plains below. There is at least one area, however, said my father, in which the priest-kings do take a most active interest upon this world. This is the area of technology. They limit most selectively the technology available to us, the men below the mountains. For example, incredibly enough, weapon technology is controlled to the point where the most powerful devices of war are the crossbow and the axe. Further, there is no mechanized transportation or communication equipment. There are no detection devices, such as the radar and sonar, so much so in evidence of the military establishments of your world on Earth. On the other hand, he said, you will learn that in lighting, shelter, agricultural, 
medicine, or, for example, the mortals or men below the mountains are quite relatively advanced. He looked at me, amusement upon his face. You wonder, he said, why the numerous, rather obvious deficits in our technology have not been repaired, in spite of the priest kings. It crosses your mind that there must exist minds upon this world capable of designing such things as, say, rifles and armored vehicles. Surely these things must have been produced, I urged. Oh, and you're right, he said grimly. From time to time, they are. But their owners are always destroyed, bursting into flame. Bursting like the envelope of blue metal? Yes, he said. It is the flame death. Merely to possess a weapon of the intricated sort. Sometimes bold individuals create to acquire such war materials, and sometimes for as years even a long, a long year escape the flame death. But sooner or later, they are found, and they are struck down. His eyes became hard. I once saw it happen. Clearly he did not wish to discuss this topic further. But what of the ship that brought me here? I asked. Surely this is a marvelous example of technology. Yes, but not of ours. That of the priest kings, he said. I do not believe the ship was manned by any of the men below the mountains. By priest kings, I asked. Frankly, said my father, I believe the ship is remotely controlled from the Sadar Mountains, as we are all said to be the voyages of acquisition. Acquisition? Yes, said my father. Long ago I made that same strange journey, as have many others. But for what end? To what purpose? I demanded. Each perhaps for a different end. Each perhaps a different purpose, he said. My father then spoke to me the world on which I now found myself. He said from what he could learn from the initiatives, who claimed to serve as the intermediaries for peace kings to the men, that the planet Gore had originally been a satellite of a far distant sun, in one of the fantastically remote blue galaxies. It was then moved by the science of the priest kings, and has been moved several times within its history, seeking again and again a new star. I regarded this story as most improbable, at least in part, for several reasons, primarily having to do with the sheer spatial improbabilities of such a migration, which, even at a speed of approximating light, would take billions of years. Moreover, in moving through space without a sun for any photosynthesis or warmth, all life would surely have been destroyed. If the planet had ever been moved at all, and I knew enough to understand that this was empirically possible, it must have been brought into our system from a much closer star. Perhaps it had even once been a satellite of Alpha Centauri, but even so the distance is still seemed almost unimaginable. Theoretically, I did admit that the planet might have been moved without destroying its life, but that engineering magnitude of such a feat, well, it staggered the imagination. Perhaps light might have been suspended temporarily, maybe hidden beneath the planet's surface. With sufficient sustenance and oxygen, for such an incredible journey. But in effect, the planet would have functioned as a gigantic sealed spacecraft. There was, of course, another possibility, and I mentioned to my father, perhaps the planet had been in our system all the time, but had been undiscovered, unlikely though that might be, given those thousands of years of study of the skies by men, from the shambling creatures of the Neander Valley, to the brilliant intellects of Mount Wilson and Palmore. To my surprise, this absurd hypothesis was most welcomed by my father. That, he said with some animation, is the theory of the sun shield.
That is why I'd like to think of the planet as a counter-Earth. Not only because of its resemblance to our own native world, but because, as a matter of fact, it is placed as a counterpoise to the Earth. It has the same plane of orbit, and maintains its orbit in such a way as to always keep that central fire between it and its planetary sister, our own Earth even though this necessitates occasional adjustments in its speeds of revolution. But surely, I protested, its existence could be discovered. One kind had a planet the size of the Earth in our own solar system. It is most impossible. You underestimate the priest kings and their own science, said my father, smiling. Any power that is capable of moving a planet, and I do believe the priest kings possess such power, is capable of effecting adjustments within the motion of the planet, such adjustments as might allow it to use the sun indefinitely as a sort of concealing shield. But the orbits of the other planets would be affected, I pointed out. Oh yes, gravitational perturbation, said my father. They can be neutralized. His eyes shone. It is at my belief, he said, that the priest kings can control the very forces of gravity, at least in some localized areas. And indeed, I believe they do so. In all probability, their control over the motion of the planet is somewhat connected with this capacity. Consider certain consequences of this power. Physical evidence, such as light or radio waves, which might reveal the presence of the planet can be prevented from doing so. The priest kings might gravitationally warp the space within our vicinity, causing the very light or radio waves to be diffused, curved, maybe deflected in such a way as to not expose their world. I must have appeared unconvinced. Well, exploratory satellites can be similarly dealt with, added my father. He paused. Of course, I only propose hypotheses, for what the priest kings do and how it is done is known only to them. I drained the last sip of the heady wine in my metal goblet. Actually, said my father, there is already evidence of the existence of the counter-earth. I looked at him. Oh, yes, certain natural signs in the radio bands of the spectrum. My astonishment must have been obvious. Yes, he said, but since the hypothesis of another world is regarded as so incredible, this evidence has been interpreted to accord with other theories, sometimes even imperfections, and the instrumentation had been supposed, rather than to ever admit the presence of another world within our solar system. But why would this evidence not be understood, I said? Oh, surely you know, he laughed. One must distinguish between the data to be interpreted and the interpretation of the data, and one chooses normally the interpretation that preserves as much as possible of their own world view. And in the thinking of the earth, there is no place for Gore, its true sister planet, the counter-earth. My father had finished speaking. He rose, and he gripped me by the shoulders. He held me for a moment. And he smiled. Then silently the door and the wall stood aside, and he strode from the room. He had not spoken to me of a role or destiny. Whatever it was to be, he did not wish to discuss the reason for which I had been brought to the counter-earth. Nor did he explain to me the contemptibly minor mysteries of the envelope and its own strange letter. Most keenly, perhaps, I missed that he had not spoken to me of himself, for I wanted to know that kindly remote stranger whose own bones were in my body, whose own blood flowed within my veins. My father. I now inform you that what I write of my own experience I know to be true, and that I have accepted upon authority what I believe to be true but I shall not be offended if you disbelieve, for I too in your place would refuse to believe. 
Indeed, on the small evidence I can present upon this narrative, you are obliged, in all honesty, to reject my testimony, or at the very least, to suspend your judgment. In fact, there is so little probability that this tale will be believed that the priest-kings of Sadar, the keepers of that sacred place, have apparently granted that it may even be recorded. I am glad of this, because I feel I must tell this story, for I have seen things of which I must speak, even if, as it is said here, only to the towers. Why have the priest-kings been so lenient in this case? Those who control the second earth. I think the answer is most simple. Enough humanity remains within them, if they are even human. For we have never seen them. To be vain, enough vanity remains in them to wish to inform you of their existence, if only in a way that you will not accept or be able to consider seriously. Perhaps there is humor in the sacred place. Perhaps irony. After all, suppose you should accept this tale, should learn the counter-earth and of the voyages of acquisition. What could you even do? Nothing. You, with your rudimentary technology of which you are so proud, you could do nothing at least for a thousand years. And by that time, if the very priest-kings choose, this planet will have found a new sun and they would have found new peoples to populate its burdened surface.